Uh, good afternoon, all of the online participants. We are starting our uh, next session on a uh, roundtable discussion on mainstream gender and disasters, resilience, and climate change adaptation, which is moderated by Ms. Niki Kotanaka, head of the SCAP South and Southwest Asia office. Um, Niki, please. Yeah, good afternoon um, to everybody here in the room and also online. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this session, a theme that is very dear to me as well, gender mainstream. So uh, Leila has already, you know, said the title, but as with everything in development or um, humanitarian, generally, the gender dimension, gender equality, you know, making sure no one's left behind, this is absolutely important. And it's also because the, uh, you know, the needs of um, women and men, children, it may be quite different, you know, and, uh, and how they access information, they, you know, process information, take action. It might, it, it is quite different often, and the roles they play can be very different. So it's absolutely important, and uh, we have a very distinguished panel um, that can share, you know, different perspectives, uh, both in terms of uh, what's possible, also what's challenging, what would be you know, recommendations in a way um, of how to really uh, include uh, both sexes, both genders uh, in um, disaster risk resilience and also climate change adaptation. So I'm just going to follow the list that I think you have the program as well and ask um, each one of the panelists to start off with their perspectives, what they'd like to offer on this. Then um, after that, we can take you know questions or you know interventions from the floor as well and have a conversation around it. So to kick off, um, I would like to ask Ms. Uh, Mariam Shisna from the National Disaster Management Authority. She is the director for programs, research, and advocacy and emergency management. So we've got about five minutes to give the presentation. Thank you. So. Um, Hello everyone. Um, good afternoon, um, I have been working with the National Disaster Management Authority for the past 10 years and I'm very close to the island and I don't come in it. So um, I think that I could bring a lot of their perspective into this session. Um, a lot of times um, when we tend to have a lot of workshops and seminars and it's more organized than in the cities and also in other regions, and we tend to really not understand their perspectives and how women in islands, island communities, and smaller communities, how different it could be of women in other cities. Other cities. So I have a lot to bring into the discussions. Please go ahead. An opportunity for others to go. No, it's okay. You can you can go ahead and take the floor. Um, yeah. Um, as from my understanding, I would say um, women are physically more vulnerable. So in terms of disasters, and uh, when I say disasters, I would more rest into the climate climate induced disasters that we are having in more these more frequently, like um, surface water flooding, or storm surge inundations. Um, Women are more uh, prone to the impacts of these disasters because um, a lot of times in island communities, women are the people who are at home taking care of children and elderly while men are out there working. And um, uh, they don't really know anything that happens at work. There's a and a communication uh, problem or anything. So it's the women leading these, uh, trying to solve these issues. But uh, most of the workshops that we have carried out, workshops in terms of uh, emergency response trainings or other disaster management planning workshops that I have carried out, women have been part of these workshops. And in some islands, women have been part of these workshops uh, more than men. And so they do understand what needs to be done, but the issue arises when it comes to the decision making at island levels, it's mostly men 
taking the decision. So sometimes um, it demands uh, the, the, the consideration or the needs of payments get affected while making the decisions. So um, I, I guess there is a, a gap between uh, in terms of response and in terms of preparation. So they have knowledge in, uh, for the preparation, but they don't really are not involved in their response. Um, but I guess I could say in some islands the dynamics are changing because when we are training the emergency response teams, we went do get more involved, but yet again, because they are more accountable to the children, the elderly, or the uh, household chores. So it, sometimes, even when they know, even when they are part of the teams, they mostly can't get involved in the actual situation in terms of their need as well. So. I guess that's something we would need to work on because uh, um, I would like to say that in all of this, a lot of most of the women who have access to information, they have access to education, they have access to internet, so they have access to information. They there they do know what to do, but it's in the action because there's a lot of other things that do you know, that calls what they could do in terms of response, in times of response. And um, in being responded as well, um, women are more prone to uh, other kind of uh, post disaster emergencies or risks that could arise, something like um, economical risks, maybe, uh, say, for example, if loss of power, uh, husband or loss of the family breadwinner, then it could be a economic loss or risk to the man in the house. And um, she may be accountable in looking after the children. So it could be, a, she, she, in that time, she becomes more vulnerable. Um, and the opposite of this could be men are uh, more emotionally vulnerable. So, I, I think this is something that we don't really consider or we don't talk much about is when we talk about women and when women their needs the want that they get neglected, oftentimes we forget to talk about men and their emotional vulnerability because they at the back of their head they do understand that they have a responsibility to provide financially and emotionally to their family. So anything happens to them, meaning it's um, it's a loss to their family. So I guess when we talk about gender mainstream, it's really important. So we should talk about what the difference is, what men and women. Thank you very much. No, that's very enlightening. Um, you know digging into, even amongst women, the differences between where they're living, right? Uh, island or, um, you know, city environments in the case of small biz. And then also this uh, gap between getting informed, knowing, and actually taking action or taking decisions. And then I think that last bit that you touched on of the men's needs, which may be different from women too, also speaks to the importance of, when you say gender equality, we're not just talking about one sex or the other, it is about both. Thank you so much. Um, let's hear some more perspectives. So I'd like to um, invite Ms. Aisha Appa, the Senior Social Protections Officer in the Ministry of Social and Family Development. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I work in the Ministry of Social and Family Development. Um, and also I do the Gender Affairs Department. So in well, this uh, question, my main area would be on social when we talk about DRR and CDA. Um, so it's like, uh, uh, we all know that both is good, but geographically where we are located in education and we are very prone and we are exposed to all types of behavioral health uh, hazards like droughts, economic cycles, very rainfall, floods, post of floods. But the thing is that um, we often, do not consider that gender mainstreaming is important to the population. That's an area that lacks 
not only just in um, when we talk about climate change, but climate change and climate um, hazards. In all the sectors, also, we have found, I um, mean, we realize that we are not, we do reflect that. The thing is that the way these disasters impact people, like different groups in our community, is very different. So, if we want to ensure a sustainable and inclusive future for everyone, we need to consider these groups as well, these vulnerable groups. And most of the time, um, the, we know that in each, like everyone who is impacted, but it is felt very disproportionately, it is felt disproportionately more by the most vulnerable in the society, which is women, young, youngsters, and also I would like to mention that persons with disabilities. Um, in Maldives, just like other developing countries, most women are involved in, and uh, most women are more involved in a home based economic activity. Um, and for example, uh, agriculture or in like, uh, fish processing, and with every flood, with every extreme weather condition, there are these economic activities that get established. I think one of the main factors when we talk about women empowerment. How independent financially they are. They are economic empowerment is very important. So when this factor is affected, we um they are more vulnerable to the risks of new these factors. And um, we have noticed um it is very different from Mali and other other island system, how women are impacted. Because most of the time in other islands. We find that uh, the women uh, from this home based income, home based um, economic activities, they tend to go to their daily expenditure. So, when this daily expenditure stops, it makes them more vulnerable. So, this is why it is so important to, uh, um, to consider uh, gender mainstreaming is so important and to have climate um, adaptation, mitigation, and other strategies. Also, I would like to highlight um, on the fact that um, sea level rise so impacts the women. We think it won't, but the thing is, um, due to sea level rise, we, um, it affects the water landfills and the freshwater availability for agriculture and other activities that we do. Again, it has a direct effect on the men. And um, we have I mean, we do not have um, specific research done based on this area, how it impacts women. It is uh, an area that we are lacking currently, but through our workshops and through our um, different uh, programs we have conducted around, we have noticed that um, there is a limit uh, access to the accurate information to an extent. We have identified certain areas that they do not have the accurate information. So again, that makes it more it makes them more vulnerable to such hazards. And as uh, my colleague have again mentioned about how the women are mostly involved in the cab green processes and they're more in, they're more involved in, in the home at home. So the first people who are affected or impacted more is the women. So when we talk about adaptation and mitigation, I think gender mainstream is very, very important because there is a very a huge difference on how it affects men and women. Additionally, I would like to highlight on um, this one point where we can't only talk about the impact, but we also need to talk about how um, you need to talk about the ability they have to bounce back from such things. And this is also very important for men. So, all the strategies and policies that we are trying to implement should be, it should um, exist in the vulnerable groups who want to have a fair and equitable environment. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Papa. So, again, echoing, I think, what um, Ms. Shizma was saying too, in terms of women's roles. Um, 
um, all the you know vulnerabilities they have, but also as caregivers you know, to others, their family or in their um, homes. We also talked about you know the risks and vulnerabilities in the event of different disasters, but also these slower ones like sea level rise and how that affects the economy of different cities. Um, and of course, you know how to be resilient because um, so that's from these um, you know um, risks. So um, thank you for um, adding that. So I'm going to um, shift over now. Perhaps we might get a little bit of an international view here too. Uh, may I invite Mr. E.C. Feingold, the Deputy Representative of UNICEF, who I understand came recently. So I'm sure he has some observations on all this, but also brings in some perspectives from also. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the invitation and also for dedicating a session to this issue that tends to be overlooked. We work on DRR and, and emergency preparedness. Um, globally, women and, and, and also children no, are two of the groups that are more affected by, by natural hazards. And at the same time, they, they typically have a less significant role uh, and presses in the process of planning and preparedness for, for DRR. And as, as you will say, also people with disabilities are also not uh, really included in, in these processes. So imagine, for example, a, a child who is a girl and also um, has a disability. It's a very vulnerable group that uh, we should be thinking more of and, 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 and putting more efforts in involving uh, them in, in these processes. Uh, for example, in the 2004 tsunami uh, that affected many countries, including Maldives, uh, the, one of the things that uh, for my attention is that the number of female deaths were three times the number of male deaths no, in, all, in all the countries that were affected by, by this uh, terrible uh, natural hazard. And, and this does not reveal the difference in impact on, on, on genders in, in these countries. Uh, one of the countries affected, uh, Sri, Sri Lanka, uh, it was found out that more women died because some of them lacked the skills that help many men survive, like swimming or tree climbing. Uh, and these were taught to children in Sri Lanka uh, to perform tasks that were done uh, nearly exclusively by, by men. So that's one of the examples of things that, that can happen. Other uh, 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 issues, for example, uh, uh, menstrual hygiene uh, or needs of pregnant, uh, pregnant women can go and address adequately in DRR planning and response if, if, if the girls and women are not well represented. And it's not because men don't want to discuss these things, but uh, uh, we might have uh, blind spots and uh, uh, these are issues that uh, might not be on top of our, of our head when we think of, of, of the planning process. So that's why uh, another example of why it's very important to women and girls in, in, this, in, in these processes. Uh, a, a key issue that also was mentioned uh, before by, by one of the panelists is in terms of access to information. So UNICEF Global data shows that, uh, for example, in the, the case of men, 71% uh, of them receive early warning uh, for emergency from a formal source. And when we compare this number with women uh, receiving uh, warnings, uh, 51% receive this through for informal and uh, social sources. So there is an, an inequity in, in how the information is reaching men and women. So um, we have some examples from, from UNICEF uh, DRR projects in other countries. Uh, this case in Fiji and Solomon Islands, in which uh, women were included in the consultations for, for DRR. It was part of the project of preparing for emergencies. And women were provided with more information about climate change and, and involved in the process. And uh, it was found um, afterwards that their self-confidence increased and they were more willing after being consulted and involved in the, the process. Uh, they would feel more confident and capable to take up decision-making role. So that's uh, an example from, from implementation of projects in the field. So in the, in, the, in the case of Maldives, I think it was already mentioned, well, there are issues in terms of uh, 
the women living in the atolls that tend to be more dependent on climate sensitive uh, natural resources as, and activities for their livelihood, including uh, subsistence farming, gardening, handicraft, uh, weaving, and fish processing. So, and men in the atolls tend to uh, seek work in urban centers and resorts. So, this uh, women uh, in the households maintaining it and caring for children and our parents. And uh, in the female headed uh, households, they tend to be in an economic disadvantage, as I was mentioning before. So, this put them in a more vulnerable uh, situation uh, when a disaster occurs. So, also an example from the, the tsunami, but for Maldives. Uh, from the 2004 tsunami, I mean, um, it was also found out that uh, women were more at risk of violence in the afterwards, in the aftermath of the, the situation, and more vulnerable to psychological and emotional stress. Um, th those are some of the, the first points that I want to make, and uh, just to add one more before I go to the next slide. Another important issue is in terms of the, the lack of data. So there is a challenge uh, related to the unavailability of the aggregated uh, data that could help in the analysis and, and decision maker and decision making. So having this information uh, would allow us to have the, the gender lenses to uh, plan better for this. So this is a, a, a pending issue that uh, we should all work on. Uh, and one, one last point, sorry. Um, it's a, at the national level, we see uh, an important presence of, presence of women uh, leading the Arab planning and response, uh, including in, in DMA and MRC. MRC. Uh, but in the ILAS, uh, this is not always the case, and we see uh, lower participation. And for example, in the CERT, in the Community Emergency Response Team that were set, uh, ideally, there should be a composition of 50% of women and men in self, but what we are seeing is that it's the participation of women and uh, it's around 35%. So that's another issue related to uh, gender. And we are. I have some other points to make, but uh, I will do it later. Uh, I think it's only the five minutes. Thank you very much. That's um, very interesting, and particularly like what strikes, you know. Using that uh, statistics from the 2004 uh, tsunami, that gap, you know, in the number of deaths, I mean, three times, that's really, really, you know, different. And also the um, access to information, how they get information, men, uh, women. I mean, that was really interesting. And also the power of data, actually, we can get from that. I think the other thing that was kind of interesting observing, you know, the two um, interventions here is that, like, while, um, you know, this consultation of, uh, or inclusion of women in consultations, uh, you know, it said it's not sufficient to actually help them in decision making or taking action. At the same time, there are there is also evidence that it builds confidence, which is one step towards it. So how do you really, you know, help them through the whole continuum sounded to me as a you know, very key point. Thank you for sharing that. And now I'd like to, um, I'm going to switch, sorry, to online now. So, um, you could hold the microphone there. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite Ms. Portia Hunt, who is Program Advisor in the UN um, Environment Program. So, um, over to you. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, hi, everyone. Great to be here virtually. Um, so, I'm a Program Advisor on Climate Services and Early Warning Systems at UNEP. So this is really where I wanted to focus my intervention today, um, seeing as early warning systems play a key role both in climate change adaptation and in disaster risk reduction as well. Um, I think I recognise a few people on the very small screen um, from when I was back in Mali last year. Um, so for those of you that don't know, UNEP is currently working on developing a Green Climate Fund proposal on early warning systems in Maldives. Um, specifically with the Met Service, NDMA and MRC at the national level. So the sort of a few entry points for gender mainstreaming that I wanted to highlight today 
relate both to some of the planned uh, or proposed activities in the Green Climate Fund proposal um, in Maldives, but also building on some of our existing early warning systems work um, in other small island states. So the first point I wanted to highlight, and I think this builds on the previous intervention in terms of data, is that understanding of gender risks. So as we've heard and as we know, uh, climate change impacts are not gender neutral. Women and girls and other vulnerable groups are disproportionately impacted by climate change and related hazards. So one of the um, activities that we're proposing in Maldives um, is building on MRC's work on vulnerability and capacity assessments and also on the hazard mapping as well. Um, which I know ESCAP is also working on, so building on those um, to better understand and integrate that data to understand the risks that communities face and their vulnerabilities, their coping capacities as well, um, and then identify the most at-risk population groups. And then based on this knowledge, be able to target um, subsequent interventions according to the needs of women and other traditionally vulnerable or marginalised groups. Then a key um, a key point in terms of early warning systems is the warning communication and dissemination. Um, again, I think building on the last intervention, access, um, access and understandability of information is really important. Um, and for early warning systems to be effective, this information must be accessible by the whole community um, and sent and disseminated in ways that all members of the community can access it and understand it. So the first step to doing that is really engaging with community members themselves, um, not just in Mali, but out um, on the outer islands as well, and specifically with women and other vulnerable groups to really um, understand their needs and capacities in terms of accessing um, information and how they perceive it. Um, and important considerations here, I think, are in terms of language requirements, uh, literacy levels and access to and preferences for different uh, communications assets. Um, so whether that's mobile phones, whether it's radio, whether it's television and um, getting a better understanding of what user specific needs are. And then based on this, uh, tailoring both the early warning information and also other climate information products according to these specific user needs and preferences. Um, and in terms of that tailoring, I think one of them is translating technical information um, into locally understandable and relevant information. Um, I know some of what the Met service can disseminate is, is very technical and perhaps difficult for some people to understand. So really, there's a need to better understand what, what information is already understandable, what needs to be adapted and what local terminologies perhaps needs to be incorporated so that everyone understands um, when a warning is given. Um, the other thing I mentioned in terms of communication channels, so using multiple communication channels to ensure redundancy um, and also based on different preferences of uh, different population groups um, and then also considering where word of mouth can also be used in terms of disseminating information. So are there existing community groups um, or women's networks that can be utilised um, also to complement other forms of um, information dissemination? Uh, then finally, in terms of the dissemination and communication, um, something that we discussed back in Mali when I was there last year is around the establishment of two-way feedback mechanisms. Um, firstly, to verify that information has been received but then also to evaluate whether and how information is perceived and acted upon, because there's, while it's great that a warning may have reached someone, if it hasn't been acted upon, it's not really that um, useful. Um, the final point um, that I wanted to highlight for now, I think is around preparedness and response capabilities, which I think really builds on quite a few of the earlier um, interventions. And here I wanted to highlight the need to specifically promote and support meaningful engagements um, and leadership roles uh, for women in disaster preparedness and response. Um, and I think in this respect, a key thing to recognise is that women, they're not just victims of climate change, but really invaluable resources as agents of change. 
So they have different but valuable knowledge and um, skills, experiences, coping mechanisms to address and manage climate risks that are really complementary and need to be used. So then in that sense, engaging women is not just about gender equality, but also about increasing the effectiveness overall um, of uh, risk reduction and adaptation. And um, so a few ways to do this. Firstly, is around um, making sure that women are involved sort of at all stages of designing and implementing preparedness plans, which I think was mentioned previously in terms of making sure women are involved in the action itself or response actions. Um, and as we've heard before, with women being the primary caregivers, they can often um, offer a holistic perspective or more holistic perspective on preparedness and response planning. Um, for example, it takes into account children and el elderly people's needs as well. Um, a couple of other things to highlight are around um, delivering targeted awareness and education campaigns for women so that they can feel ready to mobilize um, in the event of a disaster. And then the final point I wanted to mention was around um, economic empowerment. So if you have disaster risk financing, forecast based financing, making sure that is uh, responsible, uh, sorry, responsive to um, gender needs and accessible um, to women. And so I'll stop there, but happy to elaborate and looking forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you very much, um, Portia. Um, I think a lot of um, you know messages resonate with the echo of the previous uh, speakers, but I think um, your emphasis on you know everybody needs to you know have the information, understand the information, and uh, a lot of you know details in there that need to be addressed to make sure that you know everyone, um, including the women and children, uh, get that. I think the other thing you mentioned about the leadership role for parents and that leadership dimension or the agents will change. I mean, I thought also kind of thinking about earlier interventions that, you know, one thing is training and getting information and knowing, but to actually translate that into action decision, I mean, it's a change in role actually, right? So you can't suddenly, in a way, okay, a disaster hits and you become an agent of change. I mean, in a way, the society and the role that you play, the women play in the homes and the society communities already need to kind of already allow that to happen for that so that when the emergency hits that it's easier to do it perhaps as part of the preparedness as well but thanks so much for that so um last but not least i'd like to invite mr ibrahim shamil uh, who's manager uh, for programs and services of the multi and red crescent i'm sure you have a lot of experience with sports uh, thank you again uh, for the invitation and we're really happy to be here uh, I think given uh, we got quite a bit of context from the panelists around um, understanding uh, the importance of uh, gender mainstreaming and, and, and also the situation itself uh, globally and in the context of this, uh, I think uh, I try to uh, focus a bit more on uh, working towards mainstreaming, I guess, and, and uh, on the importance of actually creating an enabling environment towards that. Uh, a lot of the issues. Uh, we, we understand the risks, we understand the challenges uh, for the most part, uh, and then there are still gaps we can to identify. But uh, at, at the policy level, as humanitarian actors, as government agencies, we're working with uh, different demographics, uh, including women and other vulnerable groups. Uh, it's very key that uh, we work towards you know, creating an enabling uh, environment. So, going from uh, establishing a you know, policy or legal frameworks around uh, and integration of uh, you know gender balance, uh, ensuring that we include vulnerable groups in the work we do, especially in the work we do in communities, is very key. Uh, and it's been a key area where the United States and DNA and other colleagues have been working on a lot. Or when we're working on our DRR or climate education, climate change education projects, and there's a strong convergence now uh, in, in the work in DRR and DCA. Of climate change adaptation and, and and the importance on you know creating that environment uh, from from at the top end where you're building laws or policies, which is basically a statement of intent of what we want to achieve. Uh, it, it forms the basis of what we would like to do, what where we can where we can go, I guess, in that sense. And building on that, uh, we we try 
talked about advocacy or you know stating that there are accessibility or inclusion. Uh, these kind of uh, we are able to structure that uh, within the existing systems of things in place while so I just want to focus on on that as well. And I'd like to also share some of uh, our recent work uh, around uh, uh, CDDRM projects in, in, in partnership with uh, DMA in particular around uh, where we, we are trying to engage uh, uh, communities to prepare for disasters uh, and, and get infrastructure in place in their communities. Uh, as part of this project, uh, we are working in seven island communities. Uh, and one of the key outcomes we are trying to achieve uh, from this project is namely the establishment of uh, uh, the, the development of an island disaster management plan and a disaster management committee uh, as an outcome of, of the plan itself. Uh, on the islands we have worked so far, uh, we, we, we are working in a manner where we, we conduct workshops uh, in the development of the plan. Uh, identify the roles and responsibilities of the key personnel in the community, uh, what what they can do during the and what that, what has been done in the past as well. And, and quite a few things stick out when you're discussing about you know uh, working with uh, vulnerable groups in the community. We highlighted um, some of the past highlighted the, the importance of the role women play in uh, as caretakers or people. Who, who are responsible for their families, who look after their families, and their interests of the road. And, and by sort of seeing what's happened and what's in, uh, what we need to work towards, it's very clear that the, uh, the importance we need to put on uh, empowering uh, people who are in this position in United communities, especially. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, engagement and participation or eagerness to participate, we, we observe that the, the participants are, we try and keep a balance of you know 50 50 uh, participants, male and female, but quite a number of times it's more female than male uh, men who participate in these workshops. And, and we can observe you know eagerness uh, and what they bring to the table in terms of the discussions or the challenges they have. Uh, we, if I did, if I'm not wrong, I think we so far in our workshops, if we've had 127 participants altogether, 58 of them have been given in, in, in these workshops. And, and they've been able to sort of really bring in, in the, the role they play, the role of the Women's Development Committee, uh, which plays a uh, committee, and how they are able to mobilize people in times of disasters or emergencies to really bring together the community in this situation or to bring them to safety and also post recovery what role or what they can be in. So I think uh, I'll stop there but I'd like to sort of highlight the importance of creating that uh, institutional uh, you know and uh, enabling environment within all sectors where we are trying to bring in you know that balance or, or integration of gender and get to develop the Great. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Shamil. Really bringing in that um, the enabling framework, the institutional approach, the more systemic approach, um, and you highlighted the policy legal framework and the coherence convergence there, which is important. But also, you know, on the ground, how to implement it and to structure it as like these uh, island plans or island committees, which women are part of, so that they can assist more systematically, I guess, you know, sort of contribute and uh, benefit. So thanks very much. Um, I think all five uh, interventions here uh, uh, bring in different dimensions and example, but I think there are some common messages um, and complementary you know, messages. I would like to open the floor for questions or other contributions. Maybe we take a few and then um, if you have any, you know, anyone you'd like to address it to, maybe you can um, highlight that too so that when the uh, response round comes, um, you know, person can also respond. So online and also here in the room, any anybody? Anything that surprised you? Any thought provoking? Any sharing of experience from your you know work or life even? What you've seen? OK, 
Okay, we have a little bit of, uh, yes, I'll, I'll let you reflect. You have anything? Let, let me ask you, so out of this, for instance, and you've heard each other as well, what do you think is important to really fast track, accelerate, really, because, you know, again, we're, sometimes it's a race against time, right, this preparedness, and it's not like one day after another, you can change the way you behave or to, you know, um, contribute or play a role in community or society. So in that light, to really expedite this as, you know, fast and you know, we're about to see as possible. What is key? What is important? Yeah, I think I would like to highlight a few annoying things um, as other panelists are right here. Um, we have a lot of uh, women who are doing home based um, businesses. So when we get infected, um, it's their livelihood getting like after they already infected. So uh, that's one thing I think that's one area that we like data. We need to identify how they are applying the good side effects. So um, uh, I'm saying this because they are becoming more economically vulnerable when their livelihood gets affected. Um, uh, also, I would like to bring up one thing that uh, in 2000, 2022, I guess, um, there was this uh, national uh, financial inclusion survey done by uh, Montes Monetary Authority, and it shows that uh, uh, account ownership of men and women, so um, it's twice more for the big men than women. So it means that there are a lot of women who do economical work, who do a uh, work based in home, but then they are, they have the, their salary that get, goes into the husband's and maybe the father's account. So they are not, ex they, are, they don't really have the full access to all they are, but the amount they are. So this is also something we need to consider, especially during the disaster situations. So um, that again comes to the point that I, I mentioned earlier that we need to have this data so that we could you know, come up with a solution that maybe um, we can uh, identify and show ways or methods that these women can work on to make sure that uh, their, or their organization or their work they are doing based in home is not affected by climate induced or other kind of disasters. So those data is a need that we have to have. Can I ask a question? So uh, the census data was just recently released and we actually received the island level data which was very interesting but you know to have those kind of disaggregated information there is more details necessary, right? It, even within the islands, when the location of the housings are different, the exposure to different hazards based on the level of elevation, based on the, uh, you know, location within the islands, everything is different. So what are the initiatives, what are the works that are necessary to make sure that that connection happens between organizations to get actually data in that, you know, a smaller scale in that kind of geospatial uh, level that allows us for more uh, interaction between the data and other kind of information that is available from climate projection, from other aspects. Uh, because one of the things I heard, I don't know if it's actually that the, uh, basically location of the uh, household ever survey was identified in the very recent census. So what are the ways that agencies can really work with each other to ensure that the data comes up and then you try to kind of, you know, bring out all of these different dimensions because census really bring a lot of answers to, you know, uh, this aggregation between uh, age groups, between even migrants, uh, domestic individuals, uh, I mean, uh, immigrants uh, and uh, local partners and different, different, really a lot of different categories. So what are the needs here to ensure that uh, ministries, agencies that, that are relevant are working with each other to uh, provide this data for the purpose of CCA and DRI. 
Can I jump in with a, a bit of a provocative one, right? I mean, you're saying, you know, there's us there, but we need coordination. I heard in the previous panel that coordination is the most difficult thing to do in institutions. So I would even challenge all this data collection is actually happening. And you say there's no data or there's a lack of data. Data collection takes time. What, I mean, what, what needs to change? If it hasn't happened until today, you know, it's not probably today that you discover this is a, you know, this is an important piece of information, but yet it hasn't happened. So what needs to change to actually allow the end result, which is to understand what, and women to understand what it means with all this risk, how they cope, how they address, how do they contribute in, in their family or their community? So thinking a little bit out of the box, what do you think needs to change? What do you think needs to happen? Well, whatever it is, a discussion. But I want to push this because again, things don't happen. You know, I mean, if it hasn't happened, then the likelihood of it happening is going to be pretty low unless it changes. So, so um, what I, my opinion is that we can talk about all these strategies and what has to happen and what needs to be done, right? And also, we even do have policies also. So we do have um, strategies and actions plan, action plans as well. But uh, here we're talking about gender mainstreaming and including gender in vulnerable groups. The thing that I feel, what I, in my opinion, like only the implementation process, there's some the financing or the budgeting that lacks. Because when we talk about policies, not wrong, when we talk about policies and the laws, uh, it is there. But we, I think we lack understanding that these adaptation strategies and these um, mitigation strategies, it, it is very different. It, it would be very different from um, one group to the other. So to implement these, we need the budget, we need the financing. So um, the gender budgeting is an approach that we can use I think, when we want to be talk about the implementation process. And also another thing that is lacking is the uh, monitoring and the evaluation that we need to do, we 